Okay, hi everyone. I'm Eddie. Welcome to our second virtual meetup here at Lean Agile Brighton. Uh, we're still learning learning the ropes here, so uh, bear, bear with us. Uh, this, this time around, we've uh, we've been very fortunate to rope in two two old friends of ours and um, you know very illustrious guests they are too, uh, Jeff Watts and Paul, uh, who are here to to chat with us and to answer some of your questions. Um, I think. You know, Jeff and Paul don't really need any any introduction. They've they're just across so many different things: books, conferences, training, coaching, podcasts, apps, everything. Um, they're just like they're two of the hardest working men in agile, and uh, we're very fortunate to have them here. But I think that because we we um, we, 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 they put so much stuff out there for us to consume. I think we probably all feel like we know them already, particularly if you um, if you're fans of the podcast. Um, well, I'll t tell you a couple of things about them with relation to Lean Agile Brighton that you might not know. So uh, they've supported us for a while now. I think Jeff, you did a a meetup way back uh, a, a number of years ago. Um, it was before I joined, so you mightn't remember. Um, it's probably you know annals doing or something like that um but then also both paul and jeff uh, were um speakers at the very first lean agile brighton conference that that we ran um so they've got that distinction credit to their name as well um and i'm going to give a special call out to paul because um i, I really i don't know how he did it but uh, or why he did it but um that week he was also organizing the the london Scrum gathering, and I think that was like Monday to Thursday, and then on the Friday he came down and spoke at Brighton. And I was like, "Whoa, this guy is just this is amazing!" So thanks, Paul, for that. <laughs> but that was a that was just something that always stood out for me. Um, yeah, and and Jeff and Paul have both kind of um, supported us with prizes for our um, our draw, and um, you know we 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 we've, we've raised a lot of money for charity. To, uh, through the two conferences, and they've definitely been, been a big help with that. So they're uh, they're no strangers to Lean Agile Brighton, and uh, we're delighted to have them here today. Hi Jeff. Hi Paul. Hello mate. Hello. How are you doing? Very good. Yeah, enjoying the sunshine. It's nice. Good, good. Um, so we thought that uh, it would be good to to kind of kick this off in the manner of the the. The Agile podcast, which was to um, to start off with a, a drink, and um, and you guys tell us what what you've got there to to, to sip on throughout the the show. Go on, Jeff, you go first because um, I've got a bit more of an introduction to mine. <laughs> yeah, you're a little bit more interesting than me. I've, I'm running a little bit low on stocks, actually. To be honest, I've gone back to something that's pretty uh, safe for me. Uh, it's a brew dog. Punk IPA, um, one of my favourites, never lets you down, as they call it here, the beer that started it all. Got a lot of time for them, um, so cheers. 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 And if any of you have been following the podcast, me and Jeff have been podcasting from our homes because our homes have become our pubs for the last six weeks, is it now something like that? It feels like six years, but I think it's about six weeks. Um, and I've been I've got a mystery box of ciders down here um, and I was gonna I've got six left of my mi mystery box of 12 and I was gonna hand over to you Eddie to, to choose one of my remaining uh, ciders for me to sample this evening and uh, it's a bit like question of sport if any of you remember question of sport there's a, it's like picture board so there's there's six left to choose from you can have numbers one, only the one of these, Eddie, because it's, it's a long night otherwise. <laughs> Number one, three, six, seven, ten, or eleven, please. I'll go with seven. Oh, good choice, my friend. Lucky number seven. Lucky number seven, and we have. Oh, this looks. We have. I'll put it in front of the camera. This is Lawrence's Somerset cider, original premium cider. Never heard of this before. What's the picture of? I don't. Know, it's like um. It's a uh, two women on a um. Pressing apples, Jeff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Standing around pressing apples. It's, it looks a bit kind of, you know, it's got kind of one of those local labels. It doesn't look like it's mass produced at all. Um, 6%. Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, Corton Denim in Somerset. Ever heard of that, anyone? Corton Denim. I'll give it a whirl. So there we are. 
Six percent there for me is quite it's quite strong. I was going to say, yeah, I've heard you kind of uh, wince at six percent in the past. I guess. Well, feel, it smells like one of those rough ciders, you know, that's kind of <laughs> give me a headache in the morning. That one you drink down the cemetery. You get some interesting answers later on, there, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope no one's expecting to learn anything on this call tonight. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Um, I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to tell you what I'm drinking, but uh, as a non-drinker, you you beat me by six percent, Paul. I've got a oh really? Bex Blue just to to join in um, and have something to say cheers with. That is a zero percent. It may may contain a half percent. I can see a few. There's a few beer beers being. There's some old speckled hen now. I can see being poured. Yeah, everyone, raise raise a glass if you got something to. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Happy lockdown. Happy Didn't lockdown. we do a podcast once, Jeff, on Bex Blue? I'm sure Bex Blue was a subject of a podcast one, a, a way back. Yeah. When you when you sampled Bex, you know, non-alcoholic beer, and I'm sure we, we managed to get 30 minutes out of that at one point. Well, I, I, have, I have got a bit of a liking for different alcoholic. I have got quite a bit of Bex Blue in the fridge, actually. Um, I think I remember you being not not very kind about it, Jeff. <laughs> so we probably when we first started, I had a um, some friends of mine. We have we used to have a little um, what do we call it? I think it was called like an ideas session. So we we used to, kids who we used to go to school with just still live quite close to each other, an excuse to get together, and we just talk about random ideas that we might one day go into business with, and. Um, one of my mates is, is a little bit eccentric and he's always had this passion for making wooden baths. <laughs> uh, and that's the kind of level of things that we were talking about. Um, but one of the things that we did mention a long time ago was that if there was a really nice non-alcoholic beer, you'd be onto a winner because on the market was, was very little to choose from. And um, as well as that, if you could serve it in a pint glass rather than have it in a bottle, so you'd lose the social stigma because some people feel a little bit of pressure, um, then you it would just look like you were drinking beer. It would taste all right, and you wouldn't have to drink the alcohol. Uh, so that was that was an idea that we were talking about a few years ago. Never did anything with, and now there's a, a whole shelf, no, aisle full of different types of non-alcoholic beer and ale and non-alcoholic wine cider non-alcoholic gin and all sorts so yeah we missed the boat on that one i think we also flirted with the idea of um alcoholic cowpaw do you remember that, well, that that's Is my it? that's my thing yeah that's like so if um if any of you have, have got kids or if you've ever um bought or sampled cowpaw which is like liquid paracetamol for children it tastes amazing because it's mainly just sugar or but we thought, wouldn't it be great to do an alcoholic version of that, obviously, and call it Calpahol. So it kind of makes sense, right? But um, for legal reasons, this isn't being, oh, it is being recorded, so we probably shouldn't say that, but there we are. And, and, and just, it would be as, as well, we're, we're, we're not endorsing you, you alcohol <laughs> to your Calpahol for your children, by the way. Yeah, my doctor friend did say it was a bad idea for your liver. Alcohol and paracetamol. Not oh, okay. Well, that, yeah. In no way do we at the Our Child Podcast endorse that. Thank you. That's the that's the disclaimer. <laughs> um. So uh, yeah. Cheers anyway, and cheers, yeah, cheers. everyone. Um. So before I, before I um warm you up with some nice easy questions, um, I'll just put a quick call out to the to everyone who's on the call to say you know say, don't be shy. Send your questions in on the on the Q and A, and Ben will um will feed them to me get them to Jeff and Paul and it'll help keep uh, keep everything flowing but as well you might want to wait until we start chatting about something and it might pique your interest and you might have uh, something to chip in at that point but don't be shy this is for you as much as anything uh, so I want to um, I kind of wanted to have a theme actually around um, the evening which was um, about embracing change considering the uh, the situation we all find ourselves in and um, you know, the fact that us as agilists, we tend to talk about change a lot and, and, and our ability to cope with change and to and to um, influence change and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so I thought that would be relevant and hopefully that would kind of um, be a theme throughout the evening. But uh, I wanted to, um, to, to first um, link that to uh, the topic of books. Because so we've got... Um, We've got a couple of books that I'd like to uh, to mention and give a shout out to. So Jeff, you've got uh, your your new book, Team Mastery, is just launched. 
Thanks, mate. I've got the copy here. Oh, look at that. There we go. So <laughs> get, get your chops around that, everybody, when you can. Um, and why, why I am, um, oh, we've got another one. If anyone's got theirs, hold it up. <laughs> looking at the names. I've, I've got to go find mine now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there, there, there was something around change with this that I wanted to ask you about, Jeff, to see if, it kind of, um, if there's anything you'd like to talk about. Because it's quite different, actually. This It's a bit of a change from your usual books and from Agile books in general, right? It's quite visual. It's quite... Um, uh, more playful, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it, it definitely is a different feel to it. So I haven't. I've only, it only arrived yesterday, so I haven't. I haven't finished it yet, yeah. um, <laughs> or started it. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, uh, tell us a little bit about that because it is. It is a change, isn't it? You just flicked through and looked at the pictures. Yeah, they were pretty. <laughs> no, it is. It is different, and uh, you can't help but respond to what's going on around you and. You know, I started this process of this book when my wife was pregnant um, with our third child. Um, and so I, I was in a completely different state of mind then to what I was two years ago. Um, not necessarily good or bad, just different. Um, and you notice different things. And, you know, we were sensed different things and picked up different things going to all the, the classes and things. And one of the things that stood out for me were these milestone cards. Um, you know, today I took my first step, or today I, uh, what was it, shit myself in the bath or whatever, excuse me, <laughs> but um, little things that happen, you know, and you you got this card, you take it out and you take a photograph what, with it and you stick it on. What, what, uh, what page was that on? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was cool. Um, and so that, that just, I was just sitting down um, and I started doodling away some things that I've notice teams go through and it's just something that yeah okay that yeah something happened today and that that would it might have been small but it was quite meaningful for us as a team and you, you look back on it and you think that was a not necessarily a turning point but a, a, a certainly a, a growth point and i thought it's not a maturity model because every team will reach different milestones at different points and some teams can become great without getting to any of those milestones so it's not maturity model in that sense but people look for that kind of thing and I thought well if there are a number of things that you could look for um, and maybe either consciously work towards or just keep an eye out for uh, or reflect on I think that just might might help teams that's nice yeah and and but t t tell me a little bit about the um the visual nature of the book as well because that's a that's a, a deviation I thought well, yeah, the cards are the different thing, really, and they are massively pictorial, very graphical. And the idea being that, you know, you, you, you can see something that's going on there. Yeah, you can read. I want to try and um, reach as many people as, as possible. Some people like, like images more than text. Some people like to read things. Some people like lists. Some people like diagrams and so on. Um, and data and, and learning enters you in a different way. Uh, so it's a combination of things. It's, it's caused me logistical challenges. Wrong. It would have been a lot easier if I hadn't done that. And I knew that at the outset. Um, but I think it was it was worth doing differently. I think you need to try different things. Um, I, I, I want to see it in action. Um, I piloted it with a, with a few different teams, uh, and the response was positive. And so yeah, see how it works in the in the wild. That that's how nice. how, how are you envisaging that will will kind of work in the wild you see see teams kind of displaying it all over their um their kind of physical spaces if they get ever get back to the offices well that's it you know that's a great time to bring out something like that isn't it but um <laughs> it's a digital sense to it as well um so i get the card the cards just got, came out on my app today as well so that that um that gives you an opportunity for the digital side of things but yeah capturing it in some way either on your social media or your internal wiki or on your team yeah. space, your whiteboard. Um, it's more, more of a, you know, celebrate that moment. Take your time as a team to say, right, something has happened here. This is a good thing for us. Um, let's just log it. It's the idea iterated quite a lot. So it started off as like a team journal where you could capture, you know, what your highlights of each sprint and, and create some sort of like a, you know, a, an annual photo book type thing. Um, and with some with some pull out and interchangeable prompts for team charter and so on. Um, 
And so I see a lot of teams actually capturing their story over time and their evolution as a team. And so populating that, I think, is a, is a nice thing to look back on as a team and say, yeah, this is, this is, how, this is where we've come from and this is where we are right now and this is where we're going. That's good. I like, I like that. I mean, I've, I've been using the inspirational quotes deck from your app um, and posting one of those in my team's uh, Slack up and uh, Slack space every day and um, just kind of you know, keep people motivated, keep people ticking over. So I'll probably look at the, uh, the virtual cards for this as well. And um, I'm sure the Slack, the Slack space is going to replace the physical space for now or whatever your, your team is using. But, um, you know, we'll find ways of doing things, no, no doubt. So um, some good ideas in there. Um, and, and as you say, it was good to, to, to change things up and to, and to look for some, some changes and improvements you could make as well. Uh, which leads me, links me into the second book I wanted to talk about, which is, uh, which is this one, uh, which I just want to give a bit of a shout out to because I feel that it gets, it gets overlooked. Um, so that's Paul's Improving Agile Teams or Improving Agile Teams book. Um, and it even says it's got a picture of Paul on the back saying, embrace change. <laughs> about embracing change in prof and uh, and agile and, and I think everything that we're doing at the moment as well is about embracing change um but I think I think I, I I'll, I'll, I'll own up I'll fess up and I'll say that you know I had this one on my on my sh on my bookshelf for a while before I actually read it and I think I tweeted it at the time as well having having read it I said like you know I was disappointed in myself for not having read it sooner and for leaving it on the shelf for so long I thought it was a really good one. And particularly now when people are looking for creative ideas or things to do with their teams, just keep things fresh and keep people interested and, and, and engaged. There's a lot of wisdom and a lot of good, good um, kind of fun and creative things in there. So I want to give that a bit of a plug for you there as well, Paul. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Anything you want to um, add on that? No, it's something that a lot of people since this whole lockdown thing has, has started that I've had a lot probably is more question, more resurgence in questions about improv and how you can do a lot of it virtually because it's always seemed like something that you would only ever experience if you were face to face with a group of people or with, with your team but there's actually a lot of fun you can have on Zoom calls or or, um, or just small team sessions and just just basic kind of wordplay and what, I've, what I have learned about it is that you have to perhaps work a bit harder with it being on Zoom or, or some kind of online collaboration tool that you have to work your those um, kind of your those muscles, those creative muscles even harder because you don't have that non-verbal communication to fall back on because you can't always read people's body language and you can't see exactly what's going on. So you have to listen a bit harder. Um, the tools themselves make it harder to listen anyway, but you have to, your brain is not using it's just using uh, that, that brain power in different ways. So a lot of those kind of um, techniques in that will should kind of help people's listening skills, if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, our last um, meetup, physical meetup before we uh, we all went into lockdown was the improv night uh, with. Um, oh, yeah. With the May Day. Was it the May Days? Yeah, Liz from the May Days. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. And it's kind of sad, actually, to think that we've gone from uh, such an immersive close uh, experience uh, in one meetup to everything subsequently being so um, distributed and virtual but yeah um, but I, I have seen that I'm on their social media they're doing um, uh, distributed they're doing zoom based improv sessions yeah, well, yeah. Well, you know where there's, a, where there's a will there's a way isn't there so exactly yeah yeah there's a lot you can still learn even though you're not in the same room yeah. we're having a game of werewolves on Friday aren't we we are. That's a bit of yeah, role play and a bit of acting and a bit of influencing and negotiation skills thrown in. So yeah, that should be fun. That might be hard. Good luck. With <laughs> <that>. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna open it out a little bit because we've got a few questions flowing in now, um, and that will change change things up a bit. So we had a um, great question from Guy. Uh, so what do you think the future of the Scrum Master position looks like? And I, I presume that's in relation to how is how is it changing with regards to you know the situation we're in. Mm. It's a good question. It is a good question. Do uh, so you want to go first, Jeff, or shall I? Go for it. Okay. Um, so I, I've been chatting to a few scrum masters about kind of just just chatting with them about what they're up to at the moment, and some of the things they're they're having to probably 
work a lot harder at the moment, just given what, how is it at the moment about keeping people in touch? So a lot, cause you might have lost a lot of the non-verbals, a lot of the, um, the face-to-face -face element of the work. It's probably not healthy to be on a Zoom call all day. And I wouldn't, not many of the Scrum Masters that I've spoken to are doing that, but they are finding themselves perhaps more checking in and, and team members checking in with each other a lot more than they perhaps would do and trying to vary how they do it. So trying to, because the whole thing around Zoom fatigue that you can, you can have too many of these calls in one day and it can be actually detrimental to team growth and to, to, to teamwork because you just don't feel like you're, you're efficient. And a lot of people now I'm talking to are starting to multitask because they're on Zoom calls, but they're actually just doing other stuff and just nodding what, and to make it look like they're listening, but actually they're not even on the same screen. So I think a, a creative scrum master now is thinking, okay, how do I make, how do I make these check-ins with my team right now? How do I, how do I, how do I get a sense, a better sense? If I can't see and hear the office vibe, how do I get that? virtually um as to what it looks like in the future it's very hard to say right now i think we're going to have to be much more shrewd about because we might have limited time to be together as a team in the future we, a lot of companies now are going to change their um their approach on how much they invest in travel how much they invest in face-to-face -face meetings so good scrum masters are going to have to be a lot more clever I think about how they utilize the time that they do have as a team so perhaps facilitation will have to improve and kind of more efficiency around facilitation might have to improve Jeff any thoughts from you oh he's on mute he's writing something <laughs> he's multitasking <laughs> right yeah he's, exactly he's not listening I think he's lost his oh he's, he's basically dropped me in it he's leaving it to I me I couldn't unmute myself Oh, right, okay. I asked permission to be unmuted. <laughs> so so um, I heard from you there, Paul, there's a couple of things. There was, um, you know, being creative. That's, again, definitely awesome. That's kind of why I'm club, um, you know, pointing people to these books as well, is that, that there's good ideas in there. So the creativity will definitely help. And, and I think that kind of being prudent and, and, and mindful around people's time and how much video time and Zoom time they have and, and how to be efficient facilitating things in a virtual world as well is really important. Um, cause this, the stuff around like kind of, you know, not everything has to be asynchronous to synchronous, you know, like kind of getting that balance right as well. And I think that comes down to the facilitation role of the scrum master. Too. I think there's generally going to be a lot of fear when, when things do start and they're going to change very slowly, obviously, but there's going to have to be a real trepidation about how often do we need to get together? Is it, is it essential that we do get together? A lot more teams are going to be working from home a lot more frequently. So I think the Scrum Master's role is very different, is to try and not lose or, or not um, let a team um, kind of, um, a team ethos disband or, or, or decay. But equally, you don't want to go completely the other way and put people in an uncomfortable situation where, you know what, we don't want to get together yet. We don't feel safe enough to be together yet. Very difficult situation. Yeah. I don't think necessarily the future of the Scrum Master has changed. I just think the difference will be amplified. So those people in the Scrum Master role, and a lot of them aren't in Scrum Master roles as labeled, right? So some people will be in Scrum Master slash project manager roles. Some people will be in delivery manager roles that but expected to be a Scrum Master. There's, there's all sorts of shades of gray. And the people that, that have the, the, the more, if you, if you were to paint sort of two extremes, if you like, and obviously it's not the two extremes, but you've got the, the sort of project manager minded scrum masters and you've got the servant leader minded scrum masters. I think this, this kind of situation will really highlight really strongly those, those different mindsets, because I think the people who have the more project management mindset by default or are in an organizational culture that is expecting them to have that, then you've got a massive excuse for coordinating people. Yeah. To say, right, you can't be together anymore. So I will step in and I will hand pieces. I'll, of I'll look after this. I'll take, I'll take this. I'll, I'll, I'll own this for you. I'll drive. Yeah. Um, but the, the people with the more servant leadership default or the organizational culture that really does believe in self-organizing teams, then those teams will flourish and thrive. And, and some of them are because they know they don't have to be 
on Zoom calls all the time. And management know they don't need to be on Zoom calls all the time. They can coordinate their day and check in with each other when they need to check in with each other, pair when they need to pair with each other. And actually, they've got a lot more focus than they would if they were in an office being interrupted all the time. So I think you're going to have quite a divergence and you'll really get to see the real person in that role. Jeff, do you, question then, Jeff. Do you think teams within, let's say, I don't know, it's impossible to say, but we're at six weeks or so at the moment. Do you think a good team or a great team will have adapted to this way of working to a point where they won't go back at this point? Um, I, I wouldn't say we won't go back. I think that they will, because they will be to me the best teams they will they will pick and choose the best bits from from the the non-extremes they don't go to the extremes so they would probably like a physical space that they could go to optionally if they need it if they needed it rather than an absolute base where they have to be and then you can work from home when you need to under negotiation yeah I, I think a lot of teams, we, we sort of touched on this not, not long ago about the, the rise of sort of we work and workspace style environments, that, that sort of hub. Yeah. There's going to be some kind of transition period and it may well last a long time, I don't know. But to me, the best teams will have adapted to this situation pretty well by now. Yeah. And they will adapt quicker when things change. It's, it's, it's interesting, Jeff, that point around the kind of, you know, the, the, the contrast between the more servant leader type of scrum master versus the more project manager, man of control type. I've even witnessed um, with some, some of my um, contacts, there's like some good scrum masters who, who I would class as good servant leaders. And they've, they've lamented that just the situation initially meant things like, you know, that they're like stand ups, for example we're reverting to like a progress update. Um, like that was not their intention and it was no one's intention, but it was just, it just kind of like reverted to that, it became a round table. Here's my progress on everything initially. And um, so it was kind of interesting that that could happen naturally without anyone kind of feeling like it's my That's intention fine. to do that. That's fine. Not necessarily that it turns into a status meeting. That it's fine, but it's fine that those things unintentionally happen. For me, the great teams will call it. They'll say, "Hold on, whoa, what, what's going on here? Hold on, let's this whoa, this doesn't feel something's happening here. Let's just check and think. Right, are we getting what we want here? How can we do something a little bit more consciously, a little bit more mindfully, a little bit more deliberately, to be the kind of team that we want to be?" It, yeah, it's easy for circumstances to unconsciously change your behavior, especially when they've got other things that are even, even yeah, much more important than is our standard operating at peak efficiency. Um, there's a hell of a lot more going on that's more important than that. But when you do take some time out and think, all right, let's, let's just think, where are we right now? Could we, have we slipped? Could we get back to where we want to be, even though all this stuff is going on? Some, and, and I'll tell you what, a lot of teams are even taking an opportunity to think, can we use this as an opportunity to get better and take advantage of the situation, if you like, without seeming uh, cruel or evil or whatever. But, you know, not just letting the situation define you, but taking the situation. Yeah, well, that's that em embracing change mentality, isn't it? Mm. Um, so, I mean, what's interesting there is you're kind of like framing that in the, in the context of like good versus great. And, you know, I think we've probably all heard of, um, you know, all these various ingredients that get put out there for what makes a great team. And, and one of the important ones in psychological safety. So our next question, which is from Anonymous, um, is uh, I've, I've heard Jeff speak about psychological safety. How do you go about instilling that within a team in an organization that has failed them in the past? under a different leadership. Tough one. Um, because it, before, before you, you can't feel safe unless you have trust, but both safety and trust are not binary. And they can both be built. So it's not a case of either I trust you or I don't. I just have different degrees of trust. And I'm, I can build on and, and grow what I have in terms of trust and safety. 
So I always ask teams and, and individuals, I try and meet them, use this phrase, meet them where they are, right? So understand where they are right now, be able to understand their degree of distrust, their degree of vulnerability, um, acknowledge that, recognize that, don't try and make excuses for that. Um, and then work out what their level of, of trust is and, and work with that until, until I can deserve more. Uh, how do I deserve more? How do I earn more? By keeping my word. But it does involve a certain level of vulnerability. Uh, and the other thing, so the other thing that goes along with that in my world, I know Paul's a big fan of this, is you know, if I'm expecting somebody to be vulnerable, i.e. trust me, why would they do that unless I'm prepared to be vulnerable first? So I work with leaders to, to establish that sense of you know, walking the talk, setting, creating that environment. And that's what, it, that's what that effectively means, create the environment. Do as I do, not do as I say. Uh, and that's where psychological safety comes in a lot. Um, the, it's interesting how sort of public opinion, well, I, I'm not political, um, but public opinion has changed from from the sense of the prime minister. As soon as he's experienced coronavirus firsthand, he's talking from a di very different position. Um, I'm not saying that he's he's won over the other side of the house, but I'm saying that people have a different view of him as a human being now, perhaps, um, because he's speaking. From, they know he has this experience. Um, and that's quite an extreme example and a, and a, and a risky one to ever involve politics. But you, you're a fan of vulnerability, like all this idea of you go first. Yeah, I think it's a, a sense of leadership. If you're pre preparing, prepared to admit that you're not perfect and people that, that kind of that creates a bond and a, an empathy that human beings aren't perfect. And I think a le an organization, a leader who's willing to admit that and willing to admit uncertainty and vulnerability will probably unite a lot of their staff or teams behind them. And I think rather than trying to admit they know all the answers and I was speaking to a scrum master just a few days ago saying the same thing, how much their team and they're talking in their retrospective that, that all their team needed was, was to hear someone from the top of the organizations that hear them speak and that gave them safety that that yes it's very an, an uncertain situation but you know we're all you know we're, we're in this for the long run kind of we're 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 learning as we go things are coming out the, all the time that are, but we're prepared to pivot and change and, and that that can be reassuring just even if we don't know what's going on just a sense of um, we're in this together or, or, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing the same things as you are right now. That can, be, that, that can build a sense of trust. I want to pull out there, Paul is, is, um, even if we don't know what's going on. And I, one of the things that I encourage leaders to get comfortable saying is I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that I think is a massive part in building psychological safety because when you're operating in a complex domain, we don't know, but the human tendency is to try and work out or yeah. at least give the impression that we know this sense of strong leadership that i need to present this sense that people are confident that i know what i'm doing okay. and i think that, i think we've gone in kind of that timeline I'm, again i'm not an expert on this but that new normal that that's a phrase that's going to come out a lot now in terms of what's the new normal but people are because the shock a lot of the shock factor has probably uh, passed at this point people are saying okay they're accepting okay so we're in a very good, difficult situation. We know that there's no certain answer to this. So let's work together on how we can best make the best of the situation. And I think it's probably easier that it's easier to find that safety now than it probably was four, five, six weeks ago. I had a conversation with my daughter a few years ago. She's 17 now and she was probably, I think about now, she was probably about six, maybe something like that. We'd had, some kind of not necessarily argument but she was upset i probably told her off or told her not to do something or she asked for something and i said no or something she bad, dad. bad dad and she you know she, she was she was upset um and cut a long story short i basically said look i don't know what i'm doing as a dad i know it looks like i know what i'm doing because i'm big but i've never done this before <laughs> so 
I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work it out and it means I'll get it wrong sometimes. Um, and if I get it wrong, it's not because I'm, I'm mean, it's just cause I'm a bit rubbish at this. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was genuine. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, um, an attempt to manipulate the situation because I genuinely did feel out of my depth at that point. <laughs> um, and I think it, it had a, it had a, a big impact in our, in our relationship. Well, I think you're right there because I think even um, not to analyze your daughter too much, but <laughs> there's an expect expectation from daughter to father that you must know, you must know, you must know what we should do. You must know what the right answer is. And I think even in organizations, the status divide, the larger the status divide, the more people expect higher status players to know what to do. And I think if you can balance that status, I think, and, and admit by doing that saying, I don't know. And you know, I'm learning this as, as, as much as, as fast as you are, it equals that status and it allows you to, to be more vulnerable as a, as a, as a, as a pair, as peers, rather than as, as leaders and workers. Yeah, we need, we need people to feel safe to try things. And the more that we, we people copy what you do more than what you say. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if you're acting and behaving as if you know things, people think that's what you need to do. Um, and so you're not going to take risks. You're not going to ask for help. You're not going to admit mistakes. Um, and it's really difficult for people in leadership positions because their whole career effectively have, they've been told you need to, you know, act as if you can and fake it till you make it and yeah. go and learn all this stuff and, and, and do this, follow this economic theory and all these, all these different things where you know the answer. And they're having to unlearn that and put themselves in a really uncomfortable position. Good question. Good, good question. Yeah. So the, just to, to loop back to the question. Um, so for that team that's in an organization that's perhaps failed them or an organization where they don't feel, you know, maybe a high degree of safety. Um, what you guys were saying was just making me think like, you know, kind of, can, can that be, and should it be built? Um, from within the team itself. So like, you know, kind of, if you can build up a safe space within the team, even if the, out, you know, outside the team is, is less safe, I'm sure, surely that's a good starting point, isn't it? If you can't influence your leadership. If you've got a great team, then this, the safety is increased because you know, no one person's going to be hung out to dry. Hmm. You know, we, we either win or we fail as a team and that sort of collective sense of well even if it does go wrong we're all there for each other that that does increase that sense of safety but they also have a part to play in that your leadership can can be genuine um and and actually do you know, want to help and, and be trustworthy now have good intentions but if the team aren't prepared to take them at their word and and, and work with them then it's going to go nowhere so yeah, and and that's the sense of you know basically asking the team but what kind of relationship do you want here do you want one where you trust, you, you are able to trust your leadership? Because if you do, you're not going to get that unless you're prepared to trust your leadership. Um, so you're a massive part of this equation. So create the conditions where you feel safe to, to, to offer a certain level of trust, give them a chance to prove themselves trustworthy, um, and then build on it. A funny situation that you just reminded me of is when them. Um... <clears throat> when you get an organization where you know, the people in the team are saying we, 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 we need to be empowered, management need to empower us and let us make choices and do, do what we think is the right thing. And then management takes a step back and allows that to happen. And before too long, you start getting complaints from, from the team saying, oh, th there's no visibility of management. They've just left us to our own devices. Have you ever come across that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it Often that's not really had, for me, the big, the big thing that's often missing is that conversation about what's happening. Um, and so quite often you go to, some, you, you get this, what I call motivational debt, where you, an organization, a management, someone, anybody can create different types of motivational debt. So one, two classic examples are, you believe you're capable of doing this with autonomy, but I continue to, to micromanage you. I'm not giving you the space, you know, you, you can, you can, you, you need and you want, but equally when you need support or you don't feel confident enough, 
and you need some backing and I'm nowhere to be seen, I'm saying, no, 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 go for it, Eddie. Go on, go on. It's you, mate. No, it's all on you. Then that's, a, that's motivational debt, just a different kind, because you're now feeling absolutely scared. Um, and, and you want that conversation. So what, what, what level of comfort do you have? What level of autonomy do you feel you can cope with right now? What level of autonomy and support do you want? And what am I prepared to offer? And what can we find that, that balance that we can agree on? Have the conversations is the advice, yeah? Yeah. Cool, great stuff. I'm going to switch uh, to the next question and just change direction a little bit. So um, question from some guy called Anil. Never, never heard of him. Um, he said, he said, he's just wondering how you guys um, have embraced change in the daily work that you do um, during lockdown. I think you've embraced it more than me, Paul, haven't you? Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've, I suppose I've had to. You obviously, <laughs> you were a leading question then, Jeff, but, but, but maybe you know more than I do. Um, I think I've had, so again, mo as most people are, it's um, if you are working from home, I normally work from home when there's, um, my kids aren't at home. Um, so, so embracing change for me was embracing the fact that I'm not going to get a straight two hours at a task without an interruption or without something else going on or without um, another uh, task that I need to need to complete. So I've had to, I've had to adapt my working day um, to fit in with my with family life, but to fit in with home home learning, I'm not going to say homeschooling, because I'm not a teacher, but trying to help my kids um, adapt to, to being at home a lot more and, and the the attention span that, that that inevitably has. So I think my working practices at home have had to change. And that's quite hard being self employed. Um, and especially some of the stresses around as most of yeah, I'm sure, almost everyone on this cause is, is experiencing some kind of um, anxiety or stress due to the current situation. And um, I'm no different and, and trying to manage that whilst trying to maintain a positive focus at home um and uh, adapt to how my kids need me to be around is is tough and it's had to change my working day massively um but also pivoting on what i can offer so embracing change in the in the actual work i do is trying to make more online materials me and jeff have spent a long time in revising and redesigning some of our course material and and how we deliver stuff to allow it to be more um, appropriate for online audience. And yeah, bringing out new offerings, new ideas that I've had, the kind of the social distance in, the kind of the staying connected with the community, perhaps is, is even more important now and and offering them different ways to keep, keep in touch with us. Yeah, it's massively changed day to day. My days are very different you've done, right now. You've done a, um... You know, you've, you've not taken advantage of this, but you, you know, you've used this for good in that one thing that you, you enjoy doing is, is facilitating like coaching teams, facilitating perspectives and things like that. And now you, you're freed up to do more of that online and, you know, you have online. It's actually a lot easier. It's a lot easier than I thought. Um, and I can also, Jeff's alluding to that, I've, I've offered my services as a guest facilitator. Basically, you can book, book an hour, a couple of hours of my time and I'll come in and from a neutral standpoint and run your retrospectives without any kind of judgment or um, inside knowledge as to what's going on. And it's gone down quite well. So it's things like that that I probably would never have thought of um, if I just had head down and was going out to companies all the time. But now you've got a bit of time to think about how you might use your day differently. It's actually quite a nice change. Yeah, I say I haven't really adapted that much because um, the biggest area of adaptation for me would be if I was to, to change my training courses. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not doing much online training. Uh, I've done one course and Paul and I are going to do another one. Um, but that's pretty much it at the moment. Um, and I've, I've been, so the bigger part of my job is, is the one-to-one -one coaching, the leadership coaching, and the team coaching. And I've been doing that remotely for a couple of years anyway. Um, so... I've been coaching over Zoom for, for a long time. So that hasn't really changed. It's just that there's been perhaps a bit more of it. Um, and I've been, uh, this is the first time probably ever that I've spent seven weeks at home. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so it's completely different in that respect. Um, and spending seven days, seven weeks rather, I mean, even spending seven days having breakfast with the family in a row is, is a bit of a change. So yeah, but um, sort of adapting your mindset and, and, and finding different ways of working. So doing a lot more things in the evening when, when kids have gone to bed, for example, um, so I can free up a little bit more of my daytime just trying to flex really cool i think there's a lot of a lot of um, familiar themes in there for for a lot of people i'd imagine um we've got a, a, another question which might um you know might take a little bit deeper um it's quite a good one from Anne. so she says what what about the very different needs for autonomy within a team how would you work that out with leadership and the team do we mean individual needs for autonomy or one team's different need to another team's and says yes <laughs> within a team yeah so that's individuals so for me and uh, i'm jumping in here paul but for me um the individual differences i think should be managed between the team within the team and then the team's level of autonomy should be handled between the team and leadership um that's my opinion and that if i'm if we're if we're if five versa members of a team um and i need a little bit more support than paul then it would be my teammates that i'd be having that conversation with so that we as a team can can be a self-organizing autonomous unit uh, perhaps some of us might need a little bit more direction than others a little bit more support than others but as a team, we've got this agreement with leadership about what we are going to be responsible for, what we have authority for, what we need permission for, and so on. Would you have a different view on that, Paul? Have I, have I misinterpreted that question, do you think? No, I think, I think you're right. I wouldn't disagree with it. I, what I would add is I'm, I'm still perhaps occasionally still surprised at how few teams do actually ask that, those questions. So even of people they've worked with for years, as to how much it's quite a deep question in itself as to how much autonomy do you need on a daily basis and very few teams that if i was getting I've, I've coached would if they're fairly new to to being a team would have would have gone that that far that deep that quickly so i think it's um it's not perhaps a a straightforward question that you'd ask without you know without a, a good scrum master or someone behind you trying to unearth those but yeah i think a more mature team would, would realize that maybe over time, but it's probably not a question that gets asked straight away. And it's especially in the situation you are now, a lot of teams are probably learning that very quickly as to how much time do we need to check in with each other? How much, how much can I be left to my own devices on a daily basis? I think there's a big role for the scrum master to play in that as well, isn't there in terms of, um, you know that, that scrum master's maturity as well, and, and and the level of trust they have to allow, or al allow, or to be comfortable with, um, you know, certain team members being you know mostly silent throughout the day, but they're still yeah. producing, um, versus you know other others who might be more um, active on all the channels, but you know maybe maybe they're not getting work done, or or maybe it's just that that's not even the priority right now. Maybe it's just you know their 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 psychological safety is the priority, and 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 them feeling like you know they're they're still they still belong in the team, and that the team still exists as a kind of a, a real thing, even though we're distributed. Yeah, I, I I you know from from my background that I'm not going to disagree with you there on the on. You know, a big part of the scrum master role, but I'm also aware that not not every team out there has scrum masters, right? So, um, for me, a lot of the teams that I that I was using, well, I'll say a lot, some of the teams that I was using as the basis of the stories in team mastery, they wouldn't have scrum masters. But the great teams, it's it's the individual team members that are looking out for their teammates as well, and I think that's even more important here. So, if I'm not seeing anybody like physically every day it's a lot easier for me to go under the radar and my my state of mind my stress levels my productivity levels my engagement levels my uh, my emotions all of that stuff to just not be noticed 
but it, it, it leaks out in lots of different ways. And if you've been working with someone for a while, if you know very differently, you know that they're in a slightly different place. And I always used to consider that a sort of responsibility of mine as a member of the team, regardless of my roles from master, whatever, if, if someone was not quite okay, I'd want to just check in and say, are you all right? Is there anything you need? What's going on? Um, and so it doesn't need to be a scrum master that does that. Of course, that's their role and they're very, very important and even more important perhaps now, but I think just whether it's, it doesn't have to be anything formal, um, but you know, if you notice something, then don't expect somebody else to deal with it. So that's kind of um, linking us in nicely to what I think is going to be our final question um, before we run out of time. And it's um, how do you? It's from Jordan K. Hi, Jordan. Um, how do you coach team members who are coping with stress and anxiety because of lockdown? So you're kind of starting to drift into that anyway. That last answer, I think. Any other tips or any other kind of um, creative ways of helping with that that you guys have picked up over the last few weeks? It's a, it's potentially a minefield, isn't it? <laughs> because well, it is and it isn't, and it's a, it's a, it's just a human thing, really. It's to acknowledge it, um, humanize things, because people. I mean, so I, I'm coming at this from my, my primary perspective is is people can't be coached when they're stressed. Um, so you need to you need to be calm before you can because when you're stressed you're thinking very very blinkered narrow it's it's sort of that um, protection zone of fight flight fright flee that kind of thing um, so people just really want to feel safe to begin with they want to be heard even if there's no not an answer for them they want to be heard. They want to be they want their feelings to be acknowledged they want to feel, know that it's okay to be anxious to be stressed and and you know maybe there's an element of normality there as well so some genuine empathy um not not fake empathy yeah i, I know the same thing and certainly not one-upmanship that's not that's certainly what they don't want of oh you think you've got it bad you know <laughs> uh, that's that's not what they want uh, but equally they don't want to be patronized so it's just genuine yeah i hear you i hear you you know, I, I, that's, that's tough. But you, to solve their problems. But equally, you've got to know, my point was, is that sometimes I've got to hold my hands up and say, okay, this is potentially out of my comfort zone here as a coach, as a scrum master, as a facilitator. I feel like we're dabbling into therapy now and that's something that I don't feel qualified to deal with, right? So, yeah, know your boundaries. Um, but I think just being able to listen, you know, as long as you're not channeling someone down a particular pathway mm. is generally okay. And, and asking the question of, you know, is there anyone that can help you with this? Is there anyone whose help you need with this um, is, is a good thing. But I think generally just, just helping them feel okay, that it's normal and feel heard, I think is, is the place to start. Mm. We, even before, you know, as I saw some funny meme my, my daughter showed me the other day in Britain we don't we don't use the word COVID-19 we just say with all this shit that's going on um it's kind of our standard phrase isn't it um but even before all this shit was going on um there was still you, there was still stress in life believe it or not um and it would still affect people's ability to do their jobs and a really simple thing that people uh, that I'd seen and, I, and I've advocated and I've used really simple thing before you have your you know, even in just your daily scrum, before you get into the three questions thing, or even just telling people what's going on, just uh, a quick check-in. Just, you know what, today the commute was horrendous. I'm sweaty. I'm not ready to go yet. I haven't had my cup of coffee. And I'm in. I've got that off my chest now. It's out there. It's not clogging up my brain. Everyone's heard me. And I can now take information in similar kind of thing. Yeah. If I'm just thinking about my stress, I can't be thinking about anything else. And it might be, I'd, I'd agree, Jeff. And it might be that those things maybe now in the, in the current 
environment need to happen a bit more frequently. So maybe people need to be able to download that more than once a day. If it's, yeah. if stress levels at home do increase more frequently, maybe give people the chance to close out the day with, you know, sense to, to, to check out of what's, what's happened and, and to, to basically get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I think there's, there's, there's good stuff in there, guys. Thank you, because um, you know there's, there's realizing you know your boundaries and, and not becoming um, a pseudo therapist for anyone. But I think what a lovely um, way to finish it off is to is to kind of think about that and focus on the human aspect, Jeff, as you rightly say, is um, you know recognizing people's humanity, trying to be humane, trying to you know. Um, trying to help people to survive and, and, and to thrive in, in, in the new way of working um, and not trying to replicate exactly what we used to do in the, in, in the previous time. Um, so in, in an effort to be humane, I'm going to um, try and wrap this pretty much on time, uh, just a couple of minutes over and give everyone some of their evening back. Um, but um, before I go, I do want to just kind of thank Jeff and Paul wholeheartedly um, you know, I think I personally have learned a lot from you guys. You know, you give so much to the community. You put so much good stuff out there that we can consume and get better at our jobs. So definitely taking the opportunity from me and I know on behalf of Lean Agile Brighton and probably everyone else on the call as well. Thank you very much. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep uh, producing stuff during lockdown because it's keeping us going. Um, you know, I think I said um, whenever there's a new, a new episode of the podcast, it's on the headphones when I'm on, on my evening walk. So, you know, you're, 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 you're helping us just by doing all those things. And, uh, and please keep, keep going with it. It's nice to hear. Thank you, Eddie, for that. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone is, um, how many tickets we've got left for werewolves, Jeff? Just a pl quick plug. We're five. Five tickets. Five, and there won't be any more. So it's like a limited stock. So if you are interested in playing werewolves online on Friday evening at five o'clock, you're more than welcome. Five tickets remaining. It's all free, obviously. So, yeah. Book on Jeff's, have a look at Jeff's website for tickets. There you go, everyone. Can't pass up that offer. Um, so thanks everyone, uh, everyone for your attention and for your time and for dialing in. And, um, and we hope to see you at our future virtual sessions. Uh, we're still learning this space. You know, we're used to being in a physical, physical world, um, but it's good to see people coming in from all kinds of locations, including speakers, so that's great. Um, next week, we've got uh, Heidi Helfand, uh, who's, a, who's quite a big name uh, on, the, on the circuit, and um, she's going to be doing a talk on metrics. Um, and so that's, again, enabled by the fact that we're on Zoom now, so that's fantastic. Um, I definitely encourage everybody to have a look on Meetup and check out the details of that, and uh, it's going to be an, an, an excellent show, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So hopefully see you all again uh, next week, or, or you know, as many of you as possible. And um, Jeff and Paul, thank you very much. Cheers, thank everybody. you. Cheers. All the best, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>